really tempted to say thank you, thank you very much, you know, like, like Elvis. Um, while I certainly have opinions, that's an understatement, uh, I'm not really inclined to issue declarations. Although as colonists, some years ago, we did make one rather significant statement of that sort some years ago. In the end, declarations tend to be only very self-serving uh, and aren't really very American. We leave declarations and manifestos to the Europeans, of which the signers of the declaration really were. To sign a declaration to most people suggests a concordance of thoughts and values, a rather rare occurrence these days, or suggests having accepted the lowest common denominator. Today, at least in regard to landscape architecture, that common denominator is stewardship and sustainable practice. It's no secret that we live in a world of divisions and polarities, a world determined, quite sadly, by either ors. We're divided by red and blue states, by religions and nationalities, by race, warring factions, and economic classes. Unfortunately, divisions also exist between those seeking absolute bioatmospheric sustainability and those addressing the more aesthetic aspects of landscape architecture and if one might utter that troubled word, beauty. There's no argument that a framework for sustainable existence is very much needed and a prime concern for us all. So if we must make any declaration in this regard, we might call it the declaration of dependence. In this case, dependence on the planet, its atmosphere, its resources, and its natural systems. But what about the concerns that lie beyond those of basic subsistence, those addressing the quality of life, human comfort, and even individual and collective pleasure. We don't love a place because it's sustainable. We love it for the quality beyond those of performance. Otherwise, Chinese couples would not travel to Paris to have their wedding pictures taken in front of Notre Dame. In addition, if the food tastes like crap, we don't care if it's organic or not. Without aspirations beyond achieving sustainability, the work of the landscape architect may become only a form of environmental plumbing. We need plumbers, certainly, but we also need artists. The question then is, what does the landscape architect contribute to the making of landscapes great and small that the biologist, the hydrologist, the ethnographer, or the sociologist does not? How does a grounding, this is a mixed crowd, uh, how does a grounding in the humanities as well as the sciences create a vision that contributes to more than mere environmental management? An adage tells us that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yet with only rare exception, cultural norms circumscribe and therefore to some degree determine personal aesthetic responses. Admittedly, no designer is capable of creating places perceived by everyone as beautiful nor regarded by them as meaningful, even within the relatively small arena of a single community. We may have some agreement on functional issues and perhaps on certain cultural values as well, but within any general consensus, considerable variations of opinion will inform the appreciation of beauty. Nevertheless, we can seek to create landscapes perceived as pleasurable and beautiful by a majority of those who visit or live within them, even if those efforts, sadly, at times, will remain only at the level of aspiration. Through an understanding of social mores, values, and tastes, the profession should be able to envision places exceeding in quality, those already existing or those within the current memories of future occupants and users. Beauty isn't the composition alone of form, space, and color, but more a conglomerate phenomenon that surpasses any single factor taken in isolation, as true sustainability surpasses the horrible checklist of factors needed to uh, get LEED certification. Decades ago, what he, termed, in his, what, what he termed his gentle manifesto the Philadelphian architect Robert Venturi claimed his embrace of what he called vitality as well as validity and the difficult unity of inclusion rather than the easy unity of exclusion. 
Could we not agree on an inclusive rather than an exclusive ambition for landscape architecture? Need we divide into separate camps those who stress the social, ecological, or aesthetic dimensions of the practice that are only considered in isolation? The complexity of, con the, of the commission may regulate where the stress of the design would fall. We, we know that time, money, and politics are often paramount in determining the design and the course of its realization. Or is that only an acceptable rationalization for dismissing concerns that affect the lives of the individual and of the community? Sustainable is not antithetical to beautiful, nor is beautiful antithetical to sustainable. Environments can, and I believe should, represent an approach of both or, both and, rather than either or. An exemplary landscape from the past is the courtyard of the oranges, the Patios de los Naranjos in Seville, a setting that through almost a millennium of existence has provided a place of beauty, intelligence, and responsibility working together. Orange trees will not thrive in Seville's climate without human support. In creating the orange grove and its courtyard, which was originally the forecourt to a mosque, its makers devised a system of channels by which to irrigate the trees. They didn't conceive of their system of irrigation without a nod to beauty, however, and sought the exquisite as well as the functional. While providing a consistent water supply, tempered by controlled evaporation, the courtyard's makers used the patterning of irrigation rills to invigorate the precisely executed ground plane of tawny brick. Standing apart from this tonal homogeneity, two overflowing fountains of white marble shared with the orange trees their water while standing as the focal points of the space. With the Iberian reconquest, the Catholic Church superimposed a colossal cathedral upon the body of the mosque, and in the process appropriated the courtyard and its orange trees. While in Islamic construction, this paradise of trees with their golden fruits possess sufficient beauty to survive the transfer of ownership and the conversion of religion. The courtyard was retained not for its harvest, but for its beauty. Beauty trumped the change of faith. While we appreciate aqueducts and expressways and infrastructure for their efficiency and performance, we also appreciate places primarily or even solely for their beauty with a concord somehow collectively and perhaps even myster mysteriously achieved. There's no reason why a landscape cannot be sustainable, ecological, resilient, robust, contingent, enfranchising, contested, or given agency, or whatever the current buzzword or interest may be, and also be beautiful. It seems to me that the challenge to landscape architecture today is not to achieve peace with planetary systems alone, but to elevate the pragmatics to the level of poetics. That is to say, to treat as if poetry what first appears to be prose. In his own declaration made some 40 years ago, the sculptor Klaus Oldenburg phrased it this way. I am for an art that embroils itself with the everyday crap and still comes out on top. Admittedly, today there's a lot more crap and more pressing issues than in the 1960s when Oldenburg made his statement. But there's also a lot more opportunity for pairing responsibility and beauty, not as either or, but as both and. Thank you. <laughs>